Today, I'm gonna to show you step-by-step step in crazy detail how I went from a teenager passionate about finance and investing to owning an independent financial advice firm advising $15 million in assets in my 20s. Time to think like an investor. I'm sitting at my desk like doodling in the third grade. I said this was gonna be in crazy detail. And the teacher goes up in front of the class and says, hey class, somebody in our grade got 100% on the pop quiz last week. And everyone's like, oh, okay, who's that? And I look it up, I'm like, okay, well, it obviously wasn't me because I'm a terrible student and I'm doodling and drawing. You'll all be rather surprised who it is. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be Becky again. She gets 100 on everything. And so I'm doodling and the person who got 100% on the pop quiz last week was Josh. Everyone looks around like, what the heck, Josh? Josh was the person who got 100 on the pop quiz. And I'm thinking, wait, is there any other Josh's in the class? And this had never happened. I was the kind of kid who was so unbelievably pragmatic to a fault that if I didn't see adults doing something, I didn't see any reason to learn it. I was very observant and I thought, I don't really need to know the habitat of a salamander. What I need to know is money. I need to know about how to drive a car. I need to know about these very practical things that I see adults doing every day because after all, that's what I'm in school for. And that is exactly what this test was about. This test that I actually got 100 on, the, probably the only thing I ever got 100 on in my entire academic career, was our very first unit on money. Money was real. Money was practical. Money was something that everyone used. My parents got up in the morning early and left the house for eight or nine hours to go make it. And they would come back and I'd say, where'd you go? And it's because, well, we have to go make money. We have to pay for things with this house, these cars. They don't just pay for themselves. We have to go earn. And so immediately, as a young kid, I thought money. That's something that is real. That's something practical. That is something I'm going to have to learn. Not only was money pervasive, it was the only thing between me and the Lamborghini Hot Wheel collection that I wanted. It was the barrier to what I wanted. It was the reason my parents left in the morning. It was the reason there was a teacher to teach me in the first place. To me, this is one of the things I wanted to learn about. For these reasons, I was very bad in school because I felt that so little of it was actually practical towards real life. But when something was practical, I had this ability to get hyper-focused and go all in and really actually become a great student on those select few things that matter. Because I hated school and just all authority telling me what I had to find important and what I didn't, I ended up becoming obsessed with freedom really early on. I hated being told I couldn't spend my time doing what I wanted to do. I hated being told that I couldn't have something that I wanted. And by the way, does any of this sound familiar to you specifically who's watching this? If it does, you're gonna love what comes next. Let's fast forward. You see, every guy, regardless who you are, when you were 15, you had that day when all of a sudden you walked into school and you saw your crush and you felt it in different places. It was all of a sudden very different. At that moment, you realized this was gonna change everything. This was gonna direct your course of the rest of your life. That was kind of in some weird way the snap feeling I had or the urge I had for attention and ego and status and fitting in. It was all nested within this big, deep desire in my adolescence as I grew older to fit in with the tribe, to be the cool kid, to be popular, to be accepted. I didn't want to fit in, I was going to fit in at all costs. And what I found in our high school was that there was one way, there was one obvious way that you could rise to the top of the social hierarchy. In our high school, it was being really good at our flagship sport, which was volleyball. And so that same obsessive approach and obsessive nature I have towards things that are hyper relevant that I'm gonna need to know, I applied to this because to me, fitting in, becoming popular, having status, having my ego fulfilled was extremely relevant. It was something that I wanted visceral. I applied this obsessive passion to sports. I decided I'm going to become the best volleyball player that I could possibly be in this school and everything that I want is going to trickle down from this. This was the first time in my life where I experienced excellence in something. It was the first time where I really applied myself as hard as I physically could. When we went to practice, you know, my teammates would go home and I would stay in the gym and I'd put everything away. When my teammates talked about you know, working out, I would go in the gym and I'd stay 30 minutes later. It was this whole cliche about being the first one in and being the last one out. And when my teammates went home on weekends to go to parties, I sat and I watched film and I studied the great volleyball players and I put all of my time and effort and energy and focus into it and I obsessively dove so far and head over heels to this sport that I crushed it. I did really well. At one point I became the best volleyball player in the country and that's not just me making up. I have an award that was given to me. It was the Canadian most valuable player in the sport of volleyball in one of my key high school years and I'll tell you what this kind of screwed me up because 
There is nothing more seductive than people whispering about you. There's nothing more seductive or more gratifying to your ego than walking into a gym or going to a different city and everyone already knows who you are and they respect you and they fear you and when you walk close to them, they kind of walk around you because they know that you are the top dog in that gym. That was an experience I had over and over and over through high school. In investing, we have a saying that there's nothing that's possibly worse for a new trader or investor than having a massively profitable first trade. And that's exactly happened, not with my first trade, but with my entire life. I had an extremely successful, excellent adolescence that would end up morphing my view of what it took down the line. Now, because I was good young, I had this experience that a lot of elite young athletes have, which is that universities and colleges come knocking early. I was like 14 years old when my parents told me the first college scout had come talk to them and had expressed interest in me playing for a university team three or four years down the line from then. I started to think about my career. I had to think about, wait a second, what is it that I'm gonna do with my life after this? And I thought, okay, if I become the best volleyball player in the world, my best possible case scenario I could ever imagine, well, I would probably make two hundred dollars to $300,000 for a span of 10 years and then my career would be over. I'd kind of be back to square one. And I thought, hmm, what's the likelihood of that? I was not gonna end up being the best player in the world, probably not even remotely close. And so it was a mixture of this desire for more ego and more status combined with this desire for freedom that I had. And I started to think to myself, this volleyball thing, it isn't it. This is probably not the thing that's gonna get me ultimately to where I wanna go when I'm 35, 40, 50 years old. I wanted to be free. I wanted to build wealth. I wanted to do all these things that gratified my desires and made me feel big. And so to me, I wasn't sure that the sport was gonna be that for me beyond high school. So I did something kind of hilarious. I went to Google and I typed in highest paying jobs, least amount of work. And I went through all the results. I read a few different things and I kept reading and I realized, no offense to any pharmacists. What Google told me is that just become a pharmacist. You can make like 120 grand a year if you start your own pharmacy, you get up to like a quarter million bucks, you stand behind a desk, you clock in at nine, you clock out at five, it's freedom. <laughs> I apply that same obsessive focus that I applied to volleyball to some brand new career. For this kid who was a terrible student, I remember walking into grade 11 science after realizing I wanted to be a pharmacist and needed to maybe know chemistry, I came in with the human anatomical charts memorized and the periodic table memorized. And everyone's like, what the is going on here? How is all of a sudden Josh knowing answers to these questions in science? And this is just kind of the person I am. I really just can't give two about something until I'm immediately proven that this is something extremely practical that I need to know for my future success or my future thriving. The year is now 2010 and I'm doing something obsessively, which I always do. I look at, okay, what's this dream salary I could make? Okay, 120,000. What is that per month? Okay, that's 10,000. Okay, what is that net of taxes? Hmm, okay, well, net of taxes, that's probably 6,000, $7,000 a month. Okay, what could I afford with $7,000 a month? I went and looked at real estate and mortgage payments and I went and looked at my dream card, how much that would cost and I realized, wait a second, this career that I'm searching for doesn't even produce the income that I think I really want to live a life that I would consider thriving. And so I thought to myself, shoot, I've gone down this entire path. Well, maybe I'll have to start my own pharmacy business, or maybe I'll have to find unique ways to make money so that I can buy a Lamborghini and impress all the girls and that I can have a massive mansion and show my family that I'm worthy. I'm in this state where I'm receptive and my ears are open and I'm a curious kid looking for ways to potentially make money. In 2010, I remember sitting there and overhearing my dad and my grandfather talking about this idea of rental properties. You can buy a house and if the expenses are lower than the rent you charge people to live in it, now you have passive income. Every month you have income that's being generated and you don't have to work 40 hours a week. This blew my mind. As someone who was very pragmatic, someone who loved the idea of freedom, and someone who wanted to figure out a way to make more money than their career potential had without necessarily having to do more work, this was it. My dad said, hey Josh, I know you've you know been talking about this pharmacy thing and you've been studying rather hard, and, you know, volleyball's going well, but before you make any decisions in your career, I really just want you to read one book and then do whatever you want. And my dad in that moment gave me a copy of a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which essentially changed the trajectory of my life forever. I sat in my basement and for the first time in my life read a book cover to cover. I read the entire thing front to back in like six hours and I remember seeing the sun come up and I had class in the morning. This is it. This is the most pragmatic practical thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Go to work to earn an income 
Spend as little as possible and reinvest the difference in productive assets like real estate or stocks or an entrepreneurial venture where the time and the money are no longer linked. You invest money, you invest time up front, and then this will pay you in perpetuity, whether it's a rental property, whether it's a portfolio of dividend stocks, whether it's a business that just has very low human capital requirements. This blew me away. And so I went to the public library the next day because we didn't have Amazon back then, or we did, but it wasn't very popular. I went out and I took out as many books as they would allow me from the investing in the business section. And I start going ham. I'm going cover to cover. I'm reading Ben Graham, The Intelligent Investor. I'm reading Jack Bogle's Little Book of Common Sense Investing. I'm reading The Automatic Millionaire. I'm reading The Wealthy Barber. I'm reading every single book, real estate, stocks, starting your own businesses. And so in 2010, when I was turning about 16, that's when my life took the shift of, I need to find something really successful and high status and interesting to do, and shifted to, I need to somehow find a way to accumulate productive assets and provide value that I can charge for. And so what was the lowest entry barrier to start learning about investing in the real world? Investing in stocks. And so I asked my dad, okay, if I save up $1,000 from all these jobs that I do over the summer, will you match it and then we can invest $2,000? My dad's like, you know what? That sounds like a pretty good idea. And I said, okay, can you open the accounts for me because I'm not 18 and they will legally won't let me set up an account. And so my dad's just super furta. He helps open an account, he matches my contribution and I get started making my very first investments based on the books I was reading. The most compelling investment philosophy I came across was the philosophy of value investing. The whole Benjamin Graham, buy a company for less than it's worth, make sure you buy great management teams, low debt. There's like the intelligent investor, which is the seminal work and then the backup analysis book, which is called security analysis. And you read those two in conjunction and you start picking value stocks. But after about a year of doing this, I realized, wait a second, it's 2011, you're 16 years old. Why the hell are you buying value stocks? And for those of you who don't know, value investing is a very boring, pragmatic style of investing that has a fantastic track record and does really well during certain periods of time. However, it's so boring and the turnover is so low that you don't learn a lot in a short period of time. So what did I do? I started trading. Towards the end of 2011, I go out and buy all these influencer online stock market trading courses. And you know what? For as much as they were bullshit, some of them taught me some very important things that actually led to me having success later down the line. But now it's 2011, 2012, and I'm just stacking these different skills. I'm learning about pricing charts. I'm learning about technical analysis. I'm learning about risk management and stop losses and position sizing. I'm learning about how to see a stock that has momentum and what stories might drive the price of something versus not and how prices are really dictated by how things unfold relative to expectations as opposed to just the absolute news. I'm learning all of these things and a friend catches wind of this. In fact, it was my best friend and he was someone who was pretty ambitious as well and had these ideas of maybe starting business ventures. And so I gave him a copy of Rich Dad Poor Dad and I said, hey, let's start a company. Read this and let me know if this interests you. And he says, okay, sounds great. Within a month, we're like sitting in our parents' basements with two computers open trying to figure out, okay, what business do we start? How do we build a company? How do we come up with a product or a service? Like, what do we do? And this is like the middle of the technology app craze. And we decide, okay, why don't we start learning how to program apps and we'll build something and put it on the app store and we'll sell it and we'll become millionaires. We go through all the ropes that you go through as a new entrepreneur. You wanna come up with some fitness app and then the next thing you know, you wanna come up with some content creation website and charge with ads. We went through the whole gamut of all the different shiny objects you can chase as an internet business person. And one of the ideas that actually, funny enough, ended up working was a website where we just arbitraged Google ads. I would literally just sign up for a million Google accounts to get free Google ad spend. And then we would send a ton of traffic through a website which had ads on it. And so we would just get free ads from signing up for Google. That got shut down rather quickly and uh, Google caught onto a smart, those Google people. But throughout all these business ventures, my friend and I feel that we wanna go separate ways. He has his interests in media and experience creation and software and programming. And my passion was more in finance. You see, 2008 was like two, three years ago and everyone was still reeling from the major recession. There were all these stories about how these hedge fund managers made billions of dollars. And the stock market was a really exciting thing back then with a lot of interesting storylines. And again, I found finance to be super practical, super relevant. So that's where I wanted to focus my energy. By the way, all this would come to bite me in the ass later, but that's for another video. Through this process of starting different internet businesses, I was able to learn about web development. I learned how to build a WordPress site and how to run ads and plug different levers into a website that actually made something really interesting and really cool. Over time, I would pick up contracts to do people's web development, whether it was a small business in my hometown trying to come up with a new clothing brand or it was somebody trying to start a foundation or a charity. We would essentially put together 
websites for these people. And we would charge for that. And so that is how I kind of started to make my money throughout high school. You know, $1,000 here, $500 there, 800 bucks there. These things would add up. We are in the bull market of all bull markets. And I'm taking every dollar I'm earning and dumping it right into my investment account because I have no living expenses. And so what I'm doing is I'm buying very obscure momentum small cap businesses. And every now and then one of them hits. And so for all the investments I make that don't really go anywhere, some of them 10x, some of them 15x, some of them 20x. And I'm going through some interesting investing experiences as a kid where I come home from high school one day and I've made like $5,000. And to me at that time, $5,000 was like a lot of money and no one else in my class had $5,000. I thought I was very particularly special. I had returns that were beating Warren Buffett's returns. Little did I know you have to measure those returns against the risk, you idiot. Any monkey can get 100% return if they're taking 200% risk. I didn't know this yet. What I did know is that Warren Buffett got 22% a year and I was getting like 30% a year. So, ha. For all I knew, I was a legend. And so what I started doing was I started writing about my experiences. I started a blog because I knew how to do web development. So I had the confidence to just start writing about my investing experience online. I wanted to teach other people my age about the importance of investing young and investing early. I wanted to show them my philosophy and methodology behind buying stocks. In retrospect, guys, I didn't know anything. I was just documenting the journey, I was documenting the process, and I was making trades and posting them online. And when you put yourself out there on the internet, under your own name, crazy things happen. I took a big short position in the oil futures market in 2014, which is like hilarious to talk about. How old was I in 2014? 19 years old, I took a big position in oil future. At this point, I've probably grown my account to $25,000 and I take this position, I short oil. I was mostly monitoring the technical charts and didn't have a great grasp on the macro. And what happened from there is that oil had one of the largest sell-offs in history and my leveraged short position was making money the entire way down and I had been public about taking that position. Now, this is where things kind of get weird. You know that show Shark Tank or Dragon's Den where people pitch their idea to the dragons or the sharks or what have you? There was a kid in Canada who went on that show named Julian. Hello, dragons. My name is Julian Marchese. I'm, I'm 14 years old. I have an extreme interest in the global financial markets. And he was known as essentially this 14 year old whiz kid trader who had, who had found a way to beat the stock market while he was in class. For the last three years of my life, I've actively traded stocks, options, futures, commodities, and foreign exchange products. How old are you again, How old did you say? 14. You're 14, you trade FX? Yeah, this is the office. I trade every day from three to four when I get home from school. I'm at school for from eight to three o'clock every day. You know, I thought to myself, is there a way for me to make money, you know, without me being at the computer? And I realized, why don't I create a mechanical strategy? I've successfully created a program that intraday trades the of course you S&P have. 500. Okay, I've had enough. Guys, I've had enough. He's come with me. We're out of here. <laughs> come with me, Julian. The dragons obviously loved this. They thought it was the coolest thing ever, but I was super jealous of him. So I literally tried to dig him up. I tried MySpace, I tried Facebook, I tried all these different things, and I eventually found him and I messaged him and I told him about my blog and showed him all the things I was writing about. And he said, hey man, this is really cool. Like, congrats on hitting your trade. Like, you should come join the Leaders Investment Club. And I'm like, what the heck's the Leaders Investment Club? He's part of this club of all of these different kids across the globe who's like, dad owns a hedge fund and another one's a managing director at Goldman Sachs. And it's a bunch of like 14, 15 year old little shits who think they are the next Bill Ackman. They think they're the next Warren Buffett. They think they're these incredible legendary Wall Street figures and they're all talking in a chat room like the original Discord server. Like before there were Discord servers, we would talk on Facebook and we would come up with investing ideas and we would do these same things that these kids are doing, but we did it way back then, before it was cool. Now what blew me away is some of these kids were actually hilariously well connected. Like I remember we hopped on a Skype call one day, it was Skype before Zoom, and we had a hour long sit down with the head trading trainer at Paul Tudor Jones Hedge Fund Company. And he would sit with us and talk with us because one of these kids' dads knew him from Wharton or something. But this was a very crazy, very hopeful period of my life. I was just hitting green light after green light after green light. I went through high school, became the popular kid, became the best volleyball player in the country, said, I'm done with this, I wanna try something else, I can do whatever I set my mind to. I start investing in trading, all of a sudden that's going well. I'm making money from my classes, I'm getting inducted into these clubs, I'm talking to these people on Wall Street. Life is easy, all you have to do is put yourself out there and everything just comes together. We're gonna need to do another video. If I were to pinpoint the exponential moment in my career as one single thing, it would be what happens next. A reporter named Julia from Business Insider, who still works there, you can search her up. 
She wanted to do a piece called the top 20 under 20 in finance, the teens taking over the world of finance. Funniest thing ever, so gimmicky, hilarious. We all thought this was the coolest thing in the world, however, because she reached out to a couple members of the Leaders Investment Club to have them inducted. And so Julian essentially vouched for me and this group of guys said, hey, Josh should be on this list. And so I end up on this list of Business Insider top 20 under 20 in finance in the world because I was some kid from the middle of Canada blogging about his short oil and all of a sudden, next thing you know, this thing's getting a million hits. There's people on Wall Street like downtown Josh Brown like tweeting at us. Everything's just going bananas. I'm starting to get emails from people from local papers saying, hey, we saw you in Business Insider. We thought we'd reach out to do an interview. I said, absolutely, heck yeah. I wanted all the publicity I could get. I wanted to show the world, you know? And so I ended up in one article and then I would get reached out from another article. Six months later, I had like six big papers and news outlets that had featured me in the press. And so now I had social proof from third parties that I was kind of verified, I was kind of in, I was kind of someone who was seen as the investing guy, who was competent. And did I deserve all that? Like I put myself out there a little bit, it was cute as a kid, but the reality was I hadn't been in the real world yet. I had just been in fantasy land. You see, when you're a kid or you're like a 19 or 18 year old entrepreneur, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. If you're doing something, it's cool. Once you're 25, if it's not making money, if you don't have a business that's exponentially growing, you don't have a unicorn, it's not cool anymore. I wasn't there yet. I could kind of fake my way through everything because I had done a couple things right and gotten lucky in a couple of places publicly. Either way, now I have people I know through volleyball, I have different people in my community reaching out and saying, hey, you're the investing guy. You know, I got an inheritance from my grandma. Like, I don't know what to do with this thing. Like, it's like 50 grand, it's just sitting in a savings account. And I'm like 17, 18 years old at this point. Hey, my family pays dividends out of the business. Can you help me invest some of this money? And so all these different kids who are like between the ages of like 16 and 25 are kind of asking me to manage their money for them. And so I start tracking these people. I start entering their names down. I start recording all these people who even in passing mention the fact that, oh, you're the investing guy. I notice whenever someone sees that I have that brand value and I record their name. And now I think to myself, I have social proof. I have a list of a bunch of people, maybe 20 or 30 people who are willing to invest with me. Why would I go to university if I could maybe get in the door as an investment manager somewhere? <sighs> I think I could be a professional investment manager. It's absolutely ridiculous. But over time, I do realize that I don't actually need a college degree to get the job I want. Back then, you could become a certified financial planner with no degree. You could get your securities licenses, you know, the United States equivalent series six, series seven. You didn't really actually need a college degree to start managing investments or to build a client roster in the financial services business. It's 2013, I am now graduating high school and I start cold emailing every single financial advisor, investment manager, hedge fund, any financial investment management term I can get. I Google it, I find out who the people are in my city and I start cold emailing them. I say, hey, my name's Josh. Here's three or four different news articles on me. Here's my track record of me calling the fallout in the oil market. Career, can I have an hour of your time to talk about the business? I probably sent 50 of those emails. 40 of those people never responded. Five of them actually came back and said, you're a loser, go home, get a degree, come talk to me later. Five of them said, you know what? You remind me of me when I was a kid, let's grab coffee. And so of those five different people I met, there was one that really had my attention. He was probably one of the most successful and largest wealth managers in the entire province that I live in, state of the American people. He was kind enough to meet with me and sit through my bullshit talking about my sector rotation strategy and my quarterly earnings predictions and, and my momentum and swing trading returns. And he was so patient with me because at the time, I genuinely believed all these things worked when in reality, I had gotten lucky in a bull market. Kind of like all these kids that I've seen come up in crypto and make all this money and think they're the next kingpin in investing, all to see it go away. I was that before crypto ever happened. He gives me the time of day, he says, Josh, I think what you really need to do if you're not wanting to get a degree is you need to get sales experience. If you're gonna come in here and you're gonna want a job, you're gonna need to get your licenses, get your series six or series seven, and in Canada it's actually called the CSE and getting your CIM designation. You're gonna need to go get your CIM designation, you're gonna need to go get sales experience, and then come talk to me. And I said, done, I drop everything. And I go and start looking for sales jobs. In 2014, I start selling the highest ticket thing I can sell right off the hop, which is cars. I get into the car business because I want to learn sales skills. After all, one of the best advisors said, in order to get a job, practicality, right? I'm gonna need to learn how to sell. 
As important and as helpful as this was in my career, it was really hard. The identity crisis of the whole thing. See, to me, this all made perfect sense. I am on a one-way track to exactly what I want. But to my social groups and to my peers and to, you know, the places where I had status, they all thought I was an idiot. They were like, dude, are you serious? Did you literally just throw away college offers to go and sell cars? They didn't get it. They didn't understand. And so this was a difficult period because I gave up the thing that I was the best at. I gave up the first thing that I was truly excellent at. I gave up my identity along with it. And all the popularity and the people who actually liked me, I realized I didn't matter that much once I was outside of their system. And so I became ostracized. I became isolated in my social life. People didn't really want to hang out with me. And I would go watch these college volleyball games and I'd sit front row and I'd see my ex-teammates winning national championships and like having success and doing extraordinarily well. And I was making like $40,000 a year selling cars. That was a very difficult time of my life. Now, all of this put a massive chip on my shoulder, going from like top dog down to nobody. Identity loss, zero out of five, do not recommend. But I eventually battled through that. I got all my exams done, I got my credentials, I sold cars for like 18 months, and now I was ready. I was ready to go back to that advisor who promised me a job, and I was gonna get in. So I call him up, I'm nervous, I'm like, ready to go, and no answer. All right, all right, all right, all right. Give it, give it a little bit, call him again, no answer. Okay, that's fine, I give it a day and I call him the next day, call him up, no answer. All right, maybe I'll just send him an email, send him an email, no answer. And I do this for a month. I don't think I have phoned my girlfriend in the five years of our relationship as many times as I phoned that guy in one month. <laughs> he probably hated me. But imagine this, you almost manage a billion dollars in assets, some 17 year, 18 year old kid comes in pounding the desk wanting a job, you tell him to go and get sales experience to try to like brush him off and he comes back and he calls you like 30 times. Now, being an advisor, knowing how busy you can get, knowing where your priorities are, the fact that he ever even talked to me was a blessing. Never mind the idea of giving me a job. And eventually I see him in the street at a Canada Day celebration and he can't avoid me. And essentially he comes up and says, hey, how's it going? I say, hey, how are you? Me still thinking I possibly have a job offer with this guy. And he said, hey, your follow-up's really admirable. It's gonna do you really well in the business. Good to see you." And I walk away like beaming. I'm like over the moon. And I end up getting an email from him several days later and it just says, come to the office this date and this time. I wanna chat. Here's my chance. I've got it. So I put my suit on, right? And I'm getting my pitch ready and I'm dialed. I got the new haircut. I walk in and I walk up to the building. I'm super nervous. My heart's pounding. And the receptionist escorts me to a boardroom and I get into this boardroom and it's like me on one side and like four industry pros on the other side. And essentially it just becomes a grilling session. Just this really dead quiet room. And he says, so what, what do you think you can do for me? What do you want to do for me? And I'm like, uh, like, uh, you want me to talk to you in front of all these people? I don't know who these people are. And he's like, yeah, like, what do you want to do for my business? And like, I'm now not just talking to him, but trying to talk to appease everybody. And so I'm like, well, I can, um, you know, I'm willing to do anything. I'll work in the mail room, but I could also come up with like marketing ideas and I could cold call and I could you know, help you invest and all this stuff. And it's just bombing. It's just going so terribly. I remember just kind of squirming in that meeting and wanted to get out so bad. I finally left, I shook hands with him and have I seen him since? Seven years later, I don't think I've seen him since. <laughs> and so safe to say, I didn't get that job. I've gone through 18 months of selling cars and getting my credentials and licenses. I've watched my friends win national championships. My life is passing me by and now I've got nothing. I don't have a job offer. I don't have an education. I gave up on the one thing that I was good at. And now my day consists of like white knuckling on the way to work, doing breathing exercises because I hate my job in car sales so much. Now, what else can I really do? I think the only person who would probably take me at this stage, 19 year old kid, no college degree, all he has is a couple licenses and a couple articles in the paper, who is actually going to take a financial risk and hire me? There's one company and it falls in the class of essentially mutual fund sales companies. There was one huge downside. There was gonna be no base pay. Even in the car sales industry, if I didn't have a good month, I at least got paid minimum wage. This role, if I wanted to get into the business now, I was gonna have to do so and pretty much just eat what I kill, which is a terrible, disgusting term for, you know, you don't survive unless you get a client. But there were all these things growing through my mind. As much as I hated my job, I was thinking about the income insecurity. Like, what happens if I don't sell anything or I don't get any clients and now I default on my mortgage and my car payment? What if that gets repossessed? I don't wanna face rejection. What if I have to cold call people or walk up to people at 
networking events and introduce myself and they don't want to talk to me. They want nothing to do with me. I was also really nervous about talking to older high net worth investors. And I thought to myself, like, who's going to want to listen to me? And I was really uncomfortable and I was doubting everything. And I didn't want to be a slimy salesperson. I didn't want to have to like schmooze and then close people. What if I couldn't convince anyone to work with me? And lastly, how was I going to actually have success if I didn't really love the brand that I was working underneath? Like there were so many things running through my mind and so much doubt and so much fear. But remember that friend that I started those business with in my basement? By this time, in addition to all my other friends winning national championships and me being a loser, my other friend had actually started a successful marketing agency. And so I really looked up to him and admired him because he had gone out on his own and closed deals. He had actually found paying customers and he had employees and offices and all these cool things I was extremely jealous of. And I had nothing. And he essentially inspired me. He said, man, at some point, rubber's gonna meet the road and you can't just create content and have a good trade every now and then. You're gonna have to actually go out and do business and provide value to somebody or else you're gonna get stuck. And as much as I was jealous and resentful, he was totally right. And eventually you hate where you are so much that the only thing to do to preserve your sanity is to move. It's to switch, it's to take that leap. And that's what it was for me. It wasn't like some massive courage, it was that I got so sick that pretty much anything would be better than what I was currently in. And so I made the jump and I went to work for a mutual fund sales company. But the great thing about this role is that it was gonna allow me to actually build my own book and build my own business. And thus began my career in financial services. I think the hardest part of anybody's career when they start out is that first day where they realize there's nothing between them and the work. They've gotten their licenses, they've gotten the job, their employer set them up with the resources, they have everything they need and now they have to start dialing. They have to start making calls, they have to start reaching out, they have to start going up and talking to people and they have to start trying to sell. That first sales threshold, to me to this day, was probably one of the most difficult parts of the business. For me, it looked like my manager coming into this little teaming table area where all the young advisors the first year sat around one circular table to like get the competitive juices flowing. And there was a big leaderboard of everybody's production. He came in after my first month of being at the company he said come to my office and so I go and I sit down at his office and it's dark and it's snowing and it's like nighttime it's in the middle of winter and he says you know what I don't think that we have as much momentum here as I would have hoped you'd have by now so why don't you get out your phone and I was like what he's like yeah just get, get out your phone and so I get out my phone and he's like open up your contacts and I'm like okay and he's like What's the name there who you think would pick up the phone right now? And the blood drops out of my face and I'm like, wait a second, am I gonna sit here and cold call this person to give me their life savings while you're sitting here in the room with me? Literally the judge of my success, my boss, now is gonna watch me, this kid who sold himself as you know, being this investing all-star and having sales experience. It's like, imagine doing a role play exercise in an interview, but now it actually matters because you're calling a real person. And then you pack on top all like the, last couple of years of trauma, it's very awkward. It is unbelievably awkward. And one by one, we called client after client after client and I stuttered over my words and I said really awkward things and I tried to close them and he gave me a little feedback after every call, a little feedback after every call and he was starting to lose faith in it and I was starting to lose faith in it. But after calling 20 people, we came away with two appointments booked for the next week and that was miserable. I remember coming out of there and thinking, I can't believe I've sacrificed everything for this. Like, for this? You can't be serious. But one of those two became a client, and now I had my first client. My first client gave me $500 and $25 a month thereafter. Probably the smallest client in history of investing. And now I was loosening up a little bit, and I started to think about calling those list of 30 people who told me they might invest with me like three years ago at this point. And so I start calling them and working through them, and now some of them are accepting, okay, now I have like three appointments booked. Now it's the next month and my manager says, Josh, we don't really have the momentum we need. And he says, come into my office. And I say, no, not again. And so we go and sit there and I said, hey, just an idea. Can I try texting these people? And he's like, texting them? You think anyone's gonna respond to a text? <laughs> and me being like Gen Z millennial, I'm like, yes, they'll respond to a text. They're not gonna respond to a phone call from a guy their age at 7 p.m. at night. There's just, no one has any interest in that in my generation. He's like, okay, feel free to text them. And so I started texting and doing DMs and doing cold outreach on Instagram. And that is where I finally started to, okay, get a little bit of traction. And now there was actually volume. Months would go by and I would be posting content on social media and every now and then someone would comment or someone would like it. And then somebody would inbound from one of these pieces and I'd sit down 
down and have a meeting with them and they'd become a client, you start with the $5,000 client. And that's a massive win because it's bigger than the $500 one. And then you go on for a couple weeks and you get another client and that one's got 10,000, okay? And that's amazing. And then you go another couple weeks and nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then somebody comes and they've got 20,000, okay? And then now it's been a year and you've got a bunch of clients with five, 10, 20, $30,000. And after my first year, I have 80 clients and a million dollars in assets under management. Do the math on that. Keep laddering up. Eventually one of them refers you to like their older cousin and the older cousin has $50,000. Wow, okay, amazing. And now you're doing as best of a job as you can for this client with $50,000. And so I do such a good job and check in with them and follow up and make sure everything's good and I would make sure I'm delivering massive value. And then they would refer me to their parents and the parents had $100,000. And now we were dealing with like actual money here, okay, because $100,000, that's actually like if I earn 1% of that, that's $1,000 a year, okay. And then I got lucky. I had a family member who had an RSP, the equivalent of like a IRA or a 401k that was locked away until retirement. And this is very frowned upon. You are not supposed to do this. But they said to me, hey, I just want to support you however I can. I'm not touching this money forever. I said, you're trying to support me however you can, hey? What do you say you let me lock up this money for seven years? I will make a massive commission. And if you leave it where it is, we both end up fine. And he says, yeah, if that's what it takes, go for it. And so I had a family member who let me DSC a big RSP that he had. And that gave me like four grand. Now I had money to like get me through the next couple months. I was like, oh, okay. It's not like I'm living just off of sales now. I've actually made some sort of lump sum commission that I can work with. And that got me through the next couple months. And then you get referred up to someone with $250,000. And now you're two years into the business. And now you actually have some sort of sustainable level of referrals and goodwill and there's clients that are coming in and they're getting bigger and bigger. Nothing about the process of becoming an advisor is this exponential boom. From my experience, it's been a slow grind day after day, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. The client today is bigger than the ones you used to get and the client you get in two years from now is bigger than the ones you used to get. And eventually, if you can just hang in there and you can just survive that process, for like 24 to 30 months, you're gonna be in a point where you're self-sustaining, where all of a sudden, the income coming from all these clients is bigger than your expenses and your business costs. You're not profitable, but you're alive. And that, that was happiness. I literally just got so caught up in the business, putting one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. I didn't innovate, I didn't do anything special, I didn't come up with any incredible ideas, I didn't have an incredible marketing plan. All that happened is I just did it and did it and did it. Looking back, it was so unoptimal, but I was in survival mode. And so that's what I did for two years from late 2015 until late 2017. Now it's 2017 and I'm attending a networking breakfast. It's one of these things where you just go and try to meet other business owners and see who might give you their business. They never work. They're a complete waste of time. But this one, this was one that was a little different. I ended up meeting another guy in there who ran a financial services business, and he asked me if I had heard about this innovative young new platform called Wealthsimple. And in the States, it's something equivalent to like Betterment or, or Wealthfront, one of these digital robo-advisor companies. And he said, they're coming out with some sort of advisor product. Have you heard of this? And in fact, I actually had heard about it because I was in the hiring process with Wellsimple many, many years before this. But they were now coming out with an advisor solution. The idea was brilliant. You have a robo-advisor who could run active and passive investment strategies on the platform. And what you would do is you would essentially outsource the day-to-day -day trading and compliance of your advisory business to this robo-advisor. You would deal with the client, you would do a customized plan, you would help find out what the right asset allocation and the right financial products for them. And then you would outsource the compliance, the administration, the trading to a company that had perfectly streamlined that process. What you would get in the end is the clients would pay a substantially lower fee, we would get paid more, and someone would take care of all of our administration for us. And this was like an absolutely breakthrough idea. For me, this was like the best thing I had ever heard since entering the business. Well, Simple had found a way to effectively cut out the financial advisory firm, the dealer firm that you would work for, the strip mall company, and now you operated purely alongside the raw advisor technology that you needed. 
It was so cool. I knew some of the people at Well Simple, and so I reached out and we started talking about this more and more. And they came to visit me in my hometown. They were on a bit of a sales circuit to promote this product. And I'm not gonna lie, I was extremely hesitant at first. You know, when I was back starting with those online businesses and, and taking those different get rich quick trading stocks courses, my bullet radar had become very good from all the money I had lost trying to do MLM and affiliate marketing and stock market trading. All these different businesses I had tried that had failed had hardened me and helped me learn that only only a really good idea with really good execution from someone who really cares, that's the only business that's gonna succeed. No one succeeds running someone else's idea. And so I'm hesitant to start because it's one of these too good to be true opportunities. It just sounds too great. What if all of a sudden Wealthsimple just steals my clients? They just move on. What happens if all of a sudden I just sign some agreement and I don't own my clients anymore? All this business that I spent these years building and all this stuff that I sacrificed to at least get to survival, Am I now just gonna risk all of that again? But at the same time, this could be something that I could use to actually get a competitive advantage. You see, for me, I didn't have any strength. I didn't have experience. I didn't have a nice degree on the wall. I didn't have anything that really set me apart from the crowd. So if I could afford to spend more to acquire a customer, be more profitable, if I could have a better UI and a better customer experience, these sorts of things could set me apart. And so I ended up preparing my clients. I said, hey guys, this is a launching pad for me, this business we're in right now. I ultimately wanna own my own business. And if you're along for the ride with me, that means there will come a day where you have to choose whether to stay here or whether you're gonna come with me. I found the right time in the business and I decided, hey, I've got enough business that I could be sustainable somewhere else. And I jumped ship. And now in our business, there are non-compete agreements. And I just said, hey, I'm going over here. I'm gonna start fresh with the pipeline I have. And if you need my contact to get anything sorted, here it is. And 98% of the clients that I had at the previous company all ended up coming inbound to me and saying, no, I'm going wherever you're going. And from there, it was just a long process of administration and repapering to get everyone booked over to a new custodian and new platform. And that is how I went independent for the very first time. Now, the next few years, were crazy. I had to learn so much that I didn't know went on behind the back end of a business. I had to learn how to incorporate. I had to learn whether or not I needed a holding company or just an operating company. I needed to get accountants involved and lawyers involved. I need to figure out my own CRM software system. I need to find out what SaaS products I was gonna need. I needed to build on my whole infrastructure. I needed to learn how to train employees and staff. I needed to know how to recruit talent. Like these are all things I had no idea how to do. All I knew was I wanted my name on the door of my own business. I didn't wanna work for a brand that I didn't believe in, and ultimately I had an opportunity to do it. So after jumping ship, I had to get the speed on everything else it required to run a business very quickly. But it was one of the most meaningful and fulfilling experiences of my life to go and get my own branding done, to have my own copywriting, to have my own values and my own philosophy on my business. And so for the next few years, everything was really just a massive process of trial and error. To paying late penalties with licensing bodies, to being behind on my taxes and then having to catch up, to getting to a point where I built a sales funnel where I was actually growing so fast I couldn't service the amount of inbound prospects. Running into problems of not knowing how to scale. One of the weirdest things you can run into in business is when all of a sudden new inbound customers aren't the problem, but your ability to facilitate more and more of them becomes the problem. When that happened to me, I got in this weird area where I just shut down completely for two years. The amount that we could have grown had I known how to scale better cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably cost me double my growth in business. But all of these things are just charges. They're interest on your ignorance debt. You have this accumulated debt of things you haven't figured out yet. You're gonna pay interest on that ignorance until you stack the correct skills to overcome it. But ultimately it got to the point where I could essentially decide to select how much income I wanted. I could decide how much business I wanted to take on and ultimately how much I wanted to make. And to bring us to present day, the biggest challenge I've been going through for the last couple of years is learning how to apply leverage. I can decide what income I want or how fast I want the business to grow if I'm willing to invest an equivalent amount of time. But how do I get the business to grow without having to increase the units of time put in? How can I find a way to get more out on the end with a smaller amount of input? And that's ultimately this idea of leverage. One of the reasons I started a YouTube channel in the first place. And so now this may sound insane for a lot of new advisors, but I actually haven't reached out to get a new client in probably 18 months to two years. I haven't done any outbound lead generation, all purely just being super selective. I only grow to the extent that this new client who's come to me is actually someone I really wanna work with. 
and I take them on and they're an ideal prospect and we walk them through the process. In some small way by doing that, I am able to grow the business without necessarily growing the work because I'm taking on people I enjoy working with. They don't feel like work. Beyond one or two really big notable clients in that entire process, there were never any exponential moments. There was never any massive explosions or bursts forward. I mean, there were little tiny breakthroughs. It's slow and it's steady and it's linear, but that's much better than plateauing. It's much better than dying. But as for my quality of life and my mental state, there is no doubt in the world that it's amazing. There's literally just no way else to put it. I think in a previous life, my baseline happiness could get so low. You know, the worst case could get really bad. Whereas now, having control of my time, having control of my income, being able to do something that I really enjoy doing with my name on the door, all of these things make it really hard to get beyond a certain level of upset or a certain level of sadness. My baseline gratitude for life and my baseline happiness is so much higher than it was when I was grinding it out at the car dealership or when I was getting those first 15 clients, having to sell to make every single dollar to make the mortgage payment. Those were stressful times. I've put in the work and sacrificed my way out of those problems and now it's just onto a more fun, more exciting level of problems where I at least know the bills are paid if my new idea doesn't work out. And so I have everything I need. Not everything I want, certainly not everything I want, but I have everything I need and I have so many reasons to be grateful. The kind of things that bother me now are the sheer amount of people who were able to grow and scale a business so much more optimally and successfully than I was. It can be really depressing when you go through all those years of struggle to make it to where you were, and then you just look around and realize how many more successful people did it faster at larger scale and with what appears to be less suffering or less sacrifice. But one thing that makes me very happy about my commitment to doing YouTube is that you guys remind me every single day that my experience is special and I have something of value to give when you comment, when you like, when you send me an email saying I've helped you in your career, or when I'm able to give some sort of advice that helps someone along or encourages them. Those are the kinds of things that make me feel like I'm valuable to the world again in the face of everyone else seeming to be so much more successful and so much smarter than I am. So ultimately, if you're in the early stages of this business or you're considering getting into it, given my story and my experience, what can I do for you? What can I tell you to help you increase the likelihood of success? What can I help you to get to success faster or to do it with less sacrifice or to do it with less effort and grinding and tension? I would say a few things come to mind. One is that skill beats knowledge. I feel like I way over invested in knowledge acquisition as opposed to skill acquisition at the start. I went out and I read all the books and I'd read all the research white papers about investing, thinking that the smarter and more technical I got, the more successful I would really become. However, the real growth and the real journey only begins after you start to try and ship something, after you try and start to sell something, after you build a product and test it in the market, after you have to actually go out and communicate someone or make a sale. You know, these things like sales and persuasion and content creation and marketing and all these different skills that you need to learn how to build are so much more important than having hyper domain expertise in one area. If you can stack a bunch of real world skills that you've developed in the marketplace, that's gonna get you so much further than doing what I did at the start, which is just a lot of learning, a lot of testing, a lot of writing, which are all great things, but you need to actually go out and act. And so those of you who are really young, I think one thing I could say is that you might feel apprehensive about your ability to achieve your potential. You might be 18 or 20 and thinking about just desperately hoping you can be what you wanna be by age 30. And I wanna tell you as someone who failed on that, as someone who didn't get where they wanted to be by some age, the difference between you reaching your potential and not is your full-on commitment to reinvesting everything in yourself and avoiding shiny objects and status games along the way. If you find something, you create a great offer, you come up with a great skill, something you wanna pursue, something you're really good at, maybe you wanna go into the financial services business. The best way to achieve your potential is to avoid taking the leftover money and blowing it on cars, blowing it on watches, blowing it on going out to the club and the bottles and taking all that money and reinvest it back into your business, reinvest it back in your marketing, take online courses, develop skills, take a sales class, do whatever you need to do to reinvest in yourself and in your skills. That is gonna be the difference. The people who did that around me ended up substantially further ahead 
and I ended up with a bunch of rusting, rotting status items, which were a lot of fun and were a lot of impressive to some people. But at the end of the day, what I wish I really had was achieved my potential. That is the story in crazy detail of how I went from a teenager obsessed and very passionate about personal finance and investing to now running my own independent wealth management company. I don't think there's a ton that I left out. There might be some minor details, some really funny stories and things that happened. But for the most part, those are the general stages and the general themes. And so if this was relatable, if you learned anything at all, please let me know. Please like honestly contact me wherever you feel fit. If that's in the comments, if that's sending me a personal note, I love hearing from you guys. And so once again, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button, hit subscribe until next time.